Good morning, everyone. Give me just one minute because I am on the wrong Wi-Fi on my telephone. It's important to get on the right Wi-Fi before you go live. Otherwise, you may have a mess. Let's go ahead. I, I think we're live on Instagram. I can't tell. It says zero people are here. Let's end this. Not share it. Gosh. Could I be any worse at this stuff? All right. I'm, per I'm awful, awful, awful at technology. Let's try it again. Okay. Good morning, everyone. We are finally here. I want to thank you all for being here today. If you have not already, I am giving away a $1,600 buy-in Heartland Poker Tour seat. Completely for free. All I have to do is sign up for the contest. You may or may not win. Worst case scenario, you get a free copy of my book, The Poker Workbook, Volume 1. Someone's saying, no video or audio. If this is working on um, Instagram, let me know. Come on, Poker Workbook. Here we go. Here's The Poker Workbook, Volume 1. It is, you know, decently long. Lots of quizzes. 15 quizzes actually from myself, from Alex Fitzgerald, and from Matt Affleck. You get this ebook completely for free just by signing up to the contest. You can find the contest on my Twitter page at Jonathan Little. Was there a problem with our Inner Circle webinar yesterday? No, it was on your end. We had the webinar, it was fine. We had a lot of people. We went for four hours. It's a pretty long webinar where I answered all of the Inner Circle students' questions. Um, so, anyway. Sign up. We've already given away, actually, a $1,000 Mid-States Poker Tour Series seat to one lucky winner. And also, um, now we're giving away a $1,500 Heartland Poker Tour seat to whoever wins the contest. So all you have to do is enter that. You can find the link on my Twitter page, at Jonathan Little. All right. Today, we're going to be talking about how to improve. This is a question a lot of you have been asking consistently, over and over again. And I decided to answer it. And that's what I do here. I listen to your questions and then I answer them. So, Paul, will I repost the webinar? Every single webinar and homework question and quiz I do for pokercoaching.com is always available in the member section. It may take a day or two to get posted, but it will always be there. All right, so how do we improve? First things first, there's this idea in games that if you are actively trying to improve, you will learn to play very, very well. Maybe not perfectly, but close to perfectly over time. For example, take tic-tac-toe. Super easy game, right? Everyone who's played tic-tac-toe for more than five minutes knows how to play tic-tac-toe perfectly or close to perfectly. And if you play it for a year straight, you will play tic-tac-toe perfectly. You cannot lose. It's not a hard game. I could go play tic-tac-toe now and play at a world-class level because the game is easy, right? No one plays tic-tac-toe for money because the game is easy. Poker is a much more difficult game. The issue is, with poker, it may take you 100 million years to learn how to play it perfectly if you just sit there and play. So we don't have 100 million years as humans, so we have to figure out ways to shortcut the, the idea, I'm just going to play and try to learn by playing because learning to play by playing will not succeed. It simply will not. So what can we do? Well, you have a few options. Um, what I did when I was a young kid, I didn't know anyone. I was living in Pensacola, Florida. Hello everyone from Pensacola, Florida here. If anyone is still here, type hello in the chat because no one's saying anything. Um, I started off in Pensacola, Florida. I knew literally no one who played poker at least no one who played poker well. So what did I do? Well, I searched out resources to study. I read a lot of books. Back then I was playing Limit Hold'em, which is an antiquated dead game at this point. But I found a few books on Limit Hold'em and I studied them diligently. And, um, you know, that made me better than most people back in the day because back in the day most people had not even read a single book and I had read 10 books. Now... The problem with that method 
and there is a big problem with that method, is that it takes a lot of time, it takes a lot of time to read a lot of books, and um, the information you get could very easily be wrong. There's this big problem in many industries, but poker in particular, that you don't actually have to be an expert to write a book. A lot of people think that, oh, if you write a book, you must be good. Oh, no. Not true in poker. I've read a lot of bad books. And it's very important to be able to look at information, or at least experiment with information, to see if it is valid and good. And I'm sure you all know some information maybe was good in 1970, but it's not so good today once your opponents know how to play better, right? Um, you see this, this instance of games getting more difficult and difficult as time moves forward just by like looking at how fast people can run, how fast humans can run. In the past, they thought four-minute mile was impossible. Then someone ran a four-minute mile. Now I don't know what they're running, 340 or something like that. Because people get better. They learn better skills. They get better equipment. They get, they get um, basically, they take the information that people prior to them have used, and they use that to better themselves to allow them to play better or perform better. So I read books. The books were made by people who came before me. I took that information, consolidated it in my head, and then use that information to beat Limit Hold'em, right? So studying reading books is a great way to learn, especially if the books are by someone who is actually a winning poker player who presents information in a way that you can understand, which is what I try to do. And, you know, it's what a few other great authors out there do. Like I know Ed Miller has great books. He does a really good job of taking complicated things and making them easy to understand, which is kind of what I try to do. I really try to take lots of information I've learned to make myself a winning poker player consolidate it into a book that's not too difficult to read and not too dense, and I give that to you. Um, standing on the shoulder of giants. That's exactly right. People came before you. They learned. They worked hard. They gave you the information. You might as well use the information to improve yourself and the lives of others. All right, let's see. Good morning, James. My name is not James. My name is Jonathan. James is my baby. He will not know the answer to your question. He may know it in a few years, though. So next, what else can you do to improve? We have books, we have forums. Whenever I was young, that was the next thing I did. I read a book, then I signed up to a few poker forums. There, you can find like-minded people who have the same goals as you. If you wanna get good at poker, there are people out there who want to get good at poker as well. The problem with forums though, now, especially now, is that forums have now become overrun by people who like to complain about bad beats and people who are just not very good at poker because all of the good players moved out, <laughs> right? The good players moved out of the forums and have developed their own like Skype groups, for example. I'm a member of a few Skype groups where people talk strategy and other platforms like Discord or Telegram or whatnot. But Forums are a good way to at least get introduced to the idea that people are out there trying to learn together. And I was very fortunate back in the day. I found one specific forum, a, a sub form of a forum that was dedicated to single table tournaments, which was the game that I played. And it just happened to have some of the best players in the world there. There wasn't a whole lot of noise. It was all just good players talking. Now, over time, if you go to that forum today, it's just, I mean, to put it bluntly, a bunch of idiots talking about bad beats. But... Back in the day, that was a great resource. I have the uh, forum over at PokerCoaching.com where everyone there is trying to get good. We do not put up with nonsense. <laughs> We're there to get good, right? That is our goal. I guess I'm like Oscar the Grouch. I, I want to make sure we are learning and studying poker and not berating people, not um, poking fun at people, not being rude. You know, we all have the same goal here. And that's what we try to do. Um, so forums are a reasonable way to go about learning. You can also develop a study group. This is something I suggest everyone do. I suggest you find people who are in your area or even online who want to talk about poker, right? Let's see. Um, what's my opinion on ignition? I don't know. How can you identify good sources of information? This really is the problem with things like forums and things like books and things like study groups, right? The problem is that a lot of information is not good. You have to learn to be discerning. If people use, I mean, these are just some very broad topics that may or may not be accurate. Usually people with a higher post count 
tend to be more active. People who are more active tend to be better. That's not necessarily true. Usually people who don't say anything about bad beats are usually better. Usually people who do not berate people are usually better. Usually people who give not necessarily long, but useful responses are good. For example, if you post a hand and someone says, easy fold on flop, you fish, probably, and it could be good advice. Maybe you should fold on the flop and maybe you are a fish. But if this is like some guy with 17 posts who's just getting on there and trolling people, that's clearly not good information. There are definitely sources of information that go against these rules. And, um, you know, it's, it's, it's a tough thing. It really is a tough thing. It's tough to know who is a good source of information. But once you start seeing consistent information from the people who are known to be winners, it becomes a lot better. It's really nice to just know this person is a good player. For example, whenever I first started being on the forums, there was a guy, uh, Raptor, Dave Benefield, who was thought to be a good player. Everyone respected him. And then I figured out the people who he respected are probably also good. So I found someone who was respected. I found who they respected. And then I studied that those people too. Then I figured out who they thought was respected. And then I studied those people too. So as long as you find a few people who are respected by their peers, who also you know are winners. I mean, I was playing the same games with Raptor, right? I saw this was a good player. He was winning. It was obvious to me he was winning. You learn from that, right? Jason, no, someone call, is calling me Jason now. Ignition is an unregulated site. I presumed everyone knew that. It's the new Bovada software. I assumed everyone knew that as well. My advice on all unregulated sites is to keep the minimum amount of money on there because eventually they will take it one day. Um, that said, Ignition has skirted the law for a very long time and uh, presumably they'll keep doing that until they don't. Um, you're new to poker. Oh, thanks for doing things like this. Well, good. What do you do if you're winning in a regular game but the game starts playing really big? Realize you may be out of your bankroll, right? That's okay. So who do I respect? I actually made a post on um, Instagram of 10 players I respect. I posted it on my blog too. You can go back and find that. JonathanLittlePoker.com slash blog. Although I'm not necessarily studying from these players actively. But um, I'm a member to almost all the training sites. I bought a piece of a poker backing site just to get access to their poker training. You know, that's, that's what you have to do. Really, just look at whoever's winning at the games you want to be winning at and ask what they are doing that you are not. Something else you can do. All right, other ways to improve. Um, get like-minded friends, kind of like getting a study group. The issue is that what happens with a lot of friend groups is you all play poker. Like I have a few friends who play professionally, but we really don't talk much poker strategy. And that's fine because, you know, you play a lot of poker. You don't want to talk it all the time. But um, often topics go a different way. Like you start talking about sports or you start talking about business or you just goof off together, right? There's nothing wrong with that, but realize that that is not your study group. D&D &D says the contest drawing is plus EV. You just got a book that you was going to buy. Well, good. I'm glad you got the book for free. I do not mind. Again, we're giving away a $1,600 Heartland Poker Tour seat, also an hour of coaching with me, a year of pokercoaching.com, and six D&D poker books. We're giving away that. And, um, yeah, it's completely free. You can find, find the contest link on my Twitter, at Jonathan Little. I'm sure it's all also in many other places. All right, let's see. What else do we have? Private coaching. This is the method I've learned to be most beneficial. Now, I don't do a whole lot of private coaching anymore because I realize I would rather help the thousand people who are here than help one person at a time. But I still do private coaching from time to time. But every time I transition to a new game, or anytime I'm struggling in my current game, I hire a coach. Whenever I was just getting into poker, I went to a site, pokercoaching.com. If it sounds familiar, it's because I got the site from my coach earlier. I was one of his best students and bought the site from him eventually. And his name was Bill Seymour. He was an old grinder from the 90s. And I liked the way he thought. He was a nice, humble guy who had a lot of ideas about ways to not be an idiot. So I learned not to be an idiot from a young age. That said, I was still a bit of an idiot. But um, I was less of an idiot. So that helped me right off the bat. 
I learned the value of coaching. I paid him $100 an hour back then. So I must have already had probably four or $5,000 to my name from playing Limit Hold'em, and I got him as a coach. Next, I was playing Sit and Goes. I hired a guy, Greg Shahade, who is, um, you all may know her, his sister, Jennifer Shahade. Um, she's a Poker Stars ambassador. Greg was one of the biggest winners in the Sit and Goes. He actually played a level below me. He was smart enough to realize if you play lower but have the same win rate, that's way better because same win rate in terms of dollars per hour is way better because you have no variance. So he was smarter than everyone. He was battling in the $100 games. I was battling in the $200 and $500 games. And um, he's smart. He's an he's a international master in chess or something like this. And uh, very, very, very smart guy. I paid him $500 an hour for 10 hours of coaching. And my return on investment went from something like 5% to something like 8%. Now, that may not sound like much, but I paid back that $5,000 I paid him within one month of play. And then I continued grinding out that edge until the sit and goes died. So that was good. What do I charge? I charge $300 an hour for coaching, but I turn down most people who come to me. Just because, again, I, I don't have a lot of time for that. Um, how do you train so everything becomes intuitive? Do it over and over and over and over and over again. Practice until it becomes subconscious. Like counting your opponent's chip stack, right? It should not even be a thought. Like when I sit down at the table, I look and I know how many chips this is. It takes me half a second to count it, and then that's it. Some people, they have to like, oh, okay, let's count each stack. Let's multiply by 20. You don't need to do that. You need to know what a 20 stack is of all denominations. You need to know how many stacks equal how many chips, et cetera, et cetera. Um, let's see. <laughs> Kevin says he pledges myself to my teachings. Some people ask me a bunch of questions that I'm not answering. Go back in the past and see. It's very, very difficult for an American to get a deal with a poker site today, unless it's one of the unregulated sites, and I don't want to work with an unregulated site. Because they don't have games in America, right? Um, so anyway, back to studying. Coaching, where else did I go? I played the NBC Heads Up tournament. I hired a, not again, not the highest stakes player at Heads Up Sit and Goes. He was a $100 Sit and Go player who played all the time, had a good win rate. I think his name was, what was his name? His name was Chris Warren, I think. Um, he was on the sitting on, on the uh, heads up forum, and I respected his play. I paid him. I think I studied 20 hours with him for like $200 an hour. And um, I think I took fourth or eighth the first year I played. And then I did not cash the second year. So he made, I think I cashed for 75K and I bought in for 40. So he made 35,000 over two years of that. So that was good. Um, I moved to PLO. I hired a PLO coach. I moved to Full Ring, No Limit Hold'em Online. I hired a Full Ring online coach. And basically what it amounts to is anytime I was going to learn a new game, I hired a coach. Because when you hire a coach, it may feel expensive. Because you may think, oh my god, I'm spending $500 an hour for Greg Shahadeh's time. And he doesn't make $500 an hour, so I'm giving him a value, right? However, you are taking all of his consolidated knowledge over the years of play and getting exactly what you need to help you. A lot of people think that's just expensive for an hour of time, but it's really not. You're getting like 20 years of experience in exchange for 500 bucks or $5,000 in my case, right? So is that worth it? It turned out it was, because like I said, I paid it back in a month. The heads up coaching, right? I 10 times the investment in two tournaments. Obviously that's just variance, but that is very, very important to understand. Is ACR unregulated? America's card room. Every card room that operates within America that is not state licensed is unregulated. They are very prone to take your money at some point. Do not forget, you're playing on an unregulated site if that's what you opt to do. Is there any site you can play on in the US that is regulated? No. And that's okay. Not every state in America. There are a few states where you can play. I think uh, Nevada. New Jersey and Delaware at the moment, and other states are coming online, but no, all the other ones are unregulated. And unregulated does not necessarily mean evil and malicious, but it means protect yourself, right? Protect yourself. So next, how do we use various programs to study away from the table? We can do that now because we're talking about how to improve today. The way I do it 
is I write down all the hands that give me trouble. You can do this easily online by just like marking them with the look at later option. Um, uh, whenever I'm playing live poker, I have a method I use to write down hands. You can find it at jonathanlittlepoker.com slash notes. So those are both very good ways to go about um, taking down the hands. And then you can go through those hands later using programs like Munker Solver or Pio Solver or Flopzilla. Flopzilla is a great one for live poker because you can essentially assume your opponents are playing a specific way and then see if they're, let's say, folding too much or calling too much. Um, so that, that's a reasonable thing. You can also discuss these hands with your friends. But anyway, you can use these programs, and you need to go the, through the programs and try to find if the play you made is the play that the programs recommend. And this, the, a lot of the programs do have a fairly steep learning curve, but there are various um, YouTube videos. I'm like, what, what's the name of that site? Can't even think of YouTube today. There are various YouTube videos that will explain how to use these programs. And once you know how to use the programs, you just go through and run it over and over and over again. But be very careful with the Game Theory Optimal programs because they often assume your opponent's playing perfectly. And if you do this thing that's called node locking, which is where you assume your opponent does not play perfectly or they respond poorly or you respond differently, then they can give you a different answer, but it's really easy to screw things up. So be careful with that. Is, it, is playing online poker without a heads-up display a mistake? Probably. I know that I do not play if I don't have a heads-up display. That said, um, the other day I watched one of the best players in the world stream for the Pokar backing site without a heads-up display because he just got a new computer and he ended up winning a scoop event. So <laughs> uh, who can say if it's actually a mistake? I know many of the best players in the world just don't use heads-up displays, often because they're playing with the same players on a very regular basis. But I think it's probably a mistake. The only reason you would not use a heads-up display is if you think the heads-up display is going to make you make different make make irrational decisions and it's like i don't think that happens with me but maybe it does the issue is a lot a lot of the time you don't have a huge sample on people and you end up over adjusting to something that may or may not actually exist demonte says whenever you're using these node locking techniques what exactly changes well let's say for example you raise pre-flop big blind calls flop comes they check as they should you bet, and now they call. Their calling range is going to be different than a GTO calling range. A lot of people call too loose. A lot of people call too tight. A lot of people raise too rarely, right? It depends on the player. And so you can actually go in there and say, I think this player calls too tightly, and you can edit how the player calls. Or you can say the player never raises, right? Some people just don't check raise, and you can edit that. But if you assume the opponent plays GTO, or differently, that's going to really impact your turn strategy because on the turn, they're going to check. And now, if you assume they're playing GTO, that's going to make you play differently than if you assume they never raise on the flop, let's say. Paul, I'm not sure what you're asking. Are these softwares on my site? No. You can search them, though. Where would I recommend studying if you have a limited budget? PokerCoaching.com is completely free for a week. Go there. Now, I don't teach perfect GTO by any means. That I realize that is very difficult for many people to grasp. Even, even myself, it's difficult to grasp, difficult to apply. And I take, teach a simplified version that will allow you to actually implement a good fundamentally sound strategy in the vast majority of scenarios. And it's important to understand that if you're playing against good players, as long as you're just like pretty close to optimal, you're going to be fine. Um, like, no one's going to have a huge edge on you if they play, you know, 2% off GTO and you play 3% off GTO. Yeah, yeah, they're going to have a little bit of an edge on you, but it's not that big of a deal. How do you spot bots online? Don't worry about them. Learn to play better than the bots, because the bots are currently fish. Yeah, at summer. PokerCoaching.com. There you go. <laughs> Easy. What's the best heads-up display? I've always used Hold a Manager 2. Yeah. Hold a manager too. I don't think there's a difference between hold a manager and poker tracker, really. D. Monty, if you want to study game theory, you need to get uh, this book here. Expert Heads Up No Limit Hold'em. Very clear book on game theory. Also, I have a book coming out with Michael Acevedo in the near future called Modern Poker Theory. It's going to be 
easier to apply than this. This is a very dense book. It may not look like a big book, but it's it's a dense book. Lots of words, lots of uh, graphs. Like, look, what, what does this even mean? Figure it out. <laughs> um, so anyway. A lot of people seem to be confusing the idea of I must be GTO or I must be exploitative. And in reality, you need to play based on whatever your opponents do. Everyone likes to try to take a side for some reason. People want to fight. People want to get the idea that they are right and other people are wrong. And this is all asinine. There's, there's been a bunch of people walking around saying FGTO with explicative zone in there. And I think that's absurd. Because to beat good players, the best players in the world, you must play better GTO than them. But to beat bad players, you should not play GTO, right? Because they're making very clear mistakes and you should be figuring out their mistakes. Some people say that like GTO is not creative. You just follow a chart. Well, first off, the chart's really, really difficult to memorize. So if you can do that, you're already a super genius. And if you also have to imagine, like let's say we know a guy folds too often is it really creative to say, I just need to bluff more often? Like, duh, <laughs> right? I mean, that's just common sense. I wrote a book that's only 80 pages long that explains all the adjustments you should make to bad players. So anyway, don't, don't get wrapped up in drama. Drama is for fish. This is a well-known thing in life. If you're into drama and you get excited by people fighting and whatnot, you are missing the bigger picture, assuming you're trying to get better. Um, someone says that it seems silly to put your money on unregulated sites. Well, it depends on what your options are, right? I definitely don't have a, a problem with people who, let's say, put $50 in an unregulated site, understanding they're probably going to get robbed of it one day. And it's like going to the movies, right? If you go out to dinner in the movies, you lose $50, but you have a good time. If you put $50 on a poker site and you lose it, but you had a good time and you learned, it's probably worth it. What are good resources to identify the opponent's strategies? Just pay attention. So Avery, get, do not think that these sites are actively trying to defraud you because very often they're not. They, you have to understand most of the time when people end up defrauding someone else, they often start from a good place. This happens in business a lot where people start with the idea of we are going to do a good thing together, but inevitably money gets tight and they get desperate and they think, well, I have to screw somebody because that's how I got here in the first place. I screwed somebody. So then maybe they screw you. Um, a lot of these poker sites, they spend way too much money on marketing. And inevitably, people stop coming to the site. So they spent all their money, spent all the players' money on marketing. And, um, well, then they can't pay people. And then they go insolvent and then they close down. Some of them just don't close down. They just keep taking money. Lock poker to this. Oh, my gosh, my wife's calling. She knows. I, my wife just tried to call. She knows that I have a show right now. Um... Lockbooker did this where they knew that they could not pay people and they just kept taking people's money. So just be smart, right? Realize you're paying for an experience. The experience can help you learn, an experience cannot. So DeMonte says something about Tipton says to needle the opponents. Um, I don't know anything about this, but needling the opponents may make them play worse in a predictable manner. If you can make your opponents play worse in a predictable manner, it's probably worth it. That book was called Expert, Heads Up, No Limit, Hold'em. It's a tough, tough book, though. It's not an easy book. Some books are not easy. A lot of people want easy reads that teach them how to win immediately. This book will teach you the framework to think about game theory optimal decisions. Um, I'm not so sure why this whole issue of American sites is that big of a deal. Like, why, why are we... Why is this even an, an issue? Clearly, it's not regulated in most sites don't put much money on there you may get robbed i mean if you may get robbed just don't put much money in a place right it's kind of like walking down the street with 500 dollars in your hand you can it may be fun you'll get an experience people will look at you but um you may get robbed so you know it's okay as long as you know you're gonna get robbed sometimes so let's see what else do we have What do the bots do that make them fish? Very often, bots will just have very clear holes in their game. 
Very often they will have mistakes. Very often they will not respond well to specific bets. Remember I found one a long time ago. They would always fold unless it had like a decent made hand. It did not account for bet size. Clearly you crush that, right? It's easy to crush someone who folds to min bets. <laughs> All right, let's see. Yeah, wife is the boss, she calls. Instagram vlogs scared everyone from online unregulated sites. Today's post correct answer, sir. Raj, I have no clue what you are saying. Are you referring to the Instagram story? If you're referring to the Instagram story, the correct answer is the one that everyone, the most people voted for. So far, most people got it right. On Instagram stories, I posted uh, three hands where they were from cashgameiq.com. I think that's the site I made. Cash Game IQ. I have 10 cash game questions. And I posted three of them on Instagram. And um, two of them I thought were pretty easy. And most people got that one right. One of them was a little bit more difficult where you had top pair and you should fold it. And 60% um, of people got that one right. Oh my God, Tom. What's my opinion of global poker? It says it's legal in the US. These sites are legal. They're just operating illegally. It is perfectly legal for, I mean, sorry, it's perfectly legal for you to play on these online sites. And essentially every state, I think besides maybe Washington state. I'm not exactly sure about that. Check your own state's laws. But it's illegal for the sites to accept a payment from a bank. That is what is illegal. As far as I know, I'm not an expert on the laws. That's what I assume is what that is what I've heard is accurate. For all I know, things have changed. I think, oh my God, it, it, it's for some reason, people think that what they hear from other people is accurate. This is something that comes up a lot where say you're playing a poker tournament, right? And the tournament structure says that the dinner break is in one hour, okay? But you look at the tournament clock that's running and it says dinner break's in three hours. Which one's right? Well, you go ask the floor man, okay? Floor man says it's in one hour. Fine. You assume it's in one hour, you make your reservations. Dinner or the quote unquote dinner break comes, they say, okay, take a 15 minute break. You're like, huh? Well, you didn't ask the right floor man because that floor man did not know what was going on. Sometimes this happens. You have to make sure you ask good sources of information. At the World Series of Poker, not to throw them under the bus, but every time you go to the World Series of Poker, a lot of people have a lot of different information. And I think they've actually started to learn to say, I don't know, let me check, which is great. And in the past, so they would give you just blatantly wrong information You'd make your plans, and it turns out they were just wrong. So I learned the right people to go to. Go to the right people. If you read a random dude on Instagram and he says, online poker's illegal, stay off of it, the guy just doesn't know what he's talking about. So it's a bad source of information. When people give bad information or they propagate and share bad information, they are not a good source of information. You should essentially ignore them forever. It's okay to ignore people. You don't have to listen to every single person who talks to you. You don't have to listen to me. If you think I'm bad information, leave. <laughs> um, but don't assume that just because people talk that they must know what they're speaking about. And also don't assume that just because someone has a following that they must know what they're speaking about. Very often people get followings by using drama and using false information to get clicks. It's called a clickbait. This is what a lot of internet marketers do who are, in my opinion, unethical. But it gets followers, right? It gets, it gets dumb followers. I try to not attract dumb followers. I try to attract smart followers. And that's why I don't really use clickbait. And I don't use drama. And I don't use false information to try to get in front of you. It's okay. I don't mind. I only want good followers. Um, you say that some of the sites use Bitcoin, so they're good to go. They also still accept bank transfers. Pay attention. <laughs> if you accept Bitcoin and bank transfers, you're still accepting bank transfers. And bank transfers can come in the form of credit card processing. They can come in various forms that don't look exactly like Bitcoin. Even then, Bitcoin sites may still get shut down for some law that I'm not even aware of. Uh, 
Let's see. I, you see, I have a copy of Watchmen. I've not actually read the whole thing. I don't know why. I don't have a whole lot of time. It's come to my, my attention. I don't have a lot of time. I'm having a new baby. A new baby. I'm having another baby in um, two months or so. And my job over this last few months was to wind down. Instead, I've accepted a bunch of new projects. I may have a problem where I love to work. I may be a workaholic. And um, that's a problem. And I have to fix that problem. It's very important to understand your life leaks and account for them and make sure that they do not ruin your life, right? Some people are gambleaholics. <laughs> Some people are alcoholics. Some people are drug addicts. I tend to really, really love focusing and working. And I have to realize and figure out that I need to channel my focus into things that are relevant and important. But I also need to understand that sometimes you got to get off your drug. Is it going to be a Christmas baby? Well, I'll tell you. My birthday was on December 22nd. Okay? Mr. James was born on December 24th. This next baby is scheduled to be born on December 24th. <laughs> so in theory, baby number two and baby number one could have the exact same birthday. Or baby number two may have my birthday. Either way, my birthday is ruined, so that's okay. <sighs> Let's see. Are VPIP and preflop arrays good concepts to identify player types? Yeah, definitely. Those are like the baseline things you need to be aware of whenever you are looking at players. If someone's playing every hand, but never ever raising, well then, you know, they're, they're probably a fish. If you see someone who's playing 20 slash 23 at six handed, they're probably pretty good. Did I plan this? Uh, was it was, was the scheduling intentional? No. Sometimes you take what you can get. Bye-bye. Hey, James, come here. James, come here. Come here. Come here. You want to say hi? Hi. Hi? You want to say hi? Oh, say hi. James walked by and said bye-bye. Where are you going? Where are you going? You want, you want Oscar the Grouch? You want, you want Oscar? Oscar the Grouch? Grouch. Grouch? Can you say Grouch? Grouch. Grouch. Yeah, that's you over there. And that's you over here. Grouch. That's you over here. Gosh. To everyone who's listening to this, you're missing out on Mr. James. All right, can you say bye-bye? Bye-bye. Okay, have fun. Have a fun day. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Okay, go. Go. Go with Steffi. Go with Steffi. <laughs> oh, you fell over. Bye-bye. James fell over, poor guy. Hey, Steffi. Can you come get the mister? Okay, bye-bye. <laughs> Have a good day. There was Mr. James. Um, so let's see. Louis Philippe says, so basically, to improve, what do we do? Coaching, forums, writing down hands, studying with friends, studying with like-minded individuals, studying poker away from the table. Um, really, if you can find a good framework to study by yourself, that's what I did. Uh, that's also very, very, very useful. I used to study probably four hours a day whenever I was getting good and grinding where I would play for like six hours. Then I would study those games for like two hours. Then I would play for another six hours and I would study those games for two hours uh, using a program called Sit and Go Power Tools, which was, uh, I don't even know if it exists anymore. I, it was like ICMizer, except for much, much slower. Now, ICMizer has this new feature called Nitro, where you can just upload the whole hand history and it tells you everything you did wrong. Or at least points out things that you may have done wrong. It's amazing. Um, I just wrote a blog about it and made a video about that. You can find it at jonathanlillipoker.com slash blog. I think it's the most recent thing I posted. But um, anyway, that is fantastic for, for learning sit and goes and for learning push fold spots. So, yeah, it's good. Let's see my bankroll Bible at jonathanlillipoker.com slash bankroll said, we assumed we had a 30% ROI. What if it is higher or lower? Well, one, I'm sure you can figure this out. If your ROI is lower, you need a much bigger bankroll. Often exponentially bigger. Not just a little bit bigger, but exponentially bigger. If you have a bigger ROI, you need a smaller bankroll. Can't get much exponentially smaller, but it will get smaller. So as your return on investment goes up, you need fewer buy-ins. As it goes down, you need more buy-ins. And also as the field size increases or decreases, as you see in the bankroll Bible, you need more or less buy-ins. 
This is how you see a lot of the players in these super high roller tournaments justifying playing these with only like 50 buy-ins because they think they have a decent edge and the field size is small. Can I say that people with more than 50% VPIP are loose? Yes, people with more than like 30% VPIP are loose. <laughs> and you may find that's everyone in your game. Quite often, everyone is just loose. But yeah, Louis Philippe, find the, find the things that are giving you problems in your game and work to figure out how to solve those on your own or with the help of other people. If you can do it free, that's great. If you can sign up to a training site that is dedicated to that, it's great. Like there's dedicated spin and go sites and heads up sit and go sites and zoom sites and you know sites devoted to specific sites like party poker how to beat exactly party poker games um there's lots of lots of various sites out there my site is more devoted to tournaments and cash games in a more broad sense to help anyone who has trouble but um anyway find find people who have beat are beating the games or have beaten the games that you were trying to beat and then learn from them so, um, I have to go soon. I'm actually having needles stuck in my neck today. I'm getting a shot right here in my neck because I have terrible neck pain. I've only had it for about 10 years. Um, so they're going to try to get rid of it. Apparently I have bad nerves and arthritis in my neck. I'm a little bit young to have arthritis, but hey, sometimes you get what you get. Let's see what we have for tomorrow. Tomorrow we're going to discuss how to use your resources and time to get more time. Time is very valuable. This book right here, The 4-Hour Workweek, very, very enlightening and insightful to my life. And I'm going to share with you some advice from that book and some advice that I've learned to help you become more productive individuals. Because at the end of the day, imagine you are getting, let's say, three hours of work done per day. We could be getting 40 hours of work done per day just by better managing your time and better managing your resources. That's incredibly valuable. People ask how I have 14 books and a training site and a bunch of training videos and all of this, and I still play poker and have a family. I try to budget my time very, very intelligently. And even then, I'm not doing it right. So we can talk about that tomorrow. You say 40 hours of work in a day? 40 hours of work in your, compared to your current three hour work. I mean, for example, I write a book in about two weeks. If I sit down and decide to write a book, it's done in two weeks, ready to ship, good to go. You may ask, how is that possible? Well, we'll talk about this kind of thing tomorrow. All right, so that's gonna be it for today. Thanks for being here. Good luck in your games, enjoy yourself. If you have any questions, let me know on Twitter at Jonathan Little, sign up for the contest. You all are here every day. Someone's going to win a $1,600 or $1,500 Heartland Poker Tour seat. It might as well be you. So you can sign up for that on twitter.com slash Jonathan Little. You can just scroll down and find the tweet I posted at some point. Um, worst case, you get the Poker Workbook Volume 1 for completely free. Also, click like, subscribe, share, whatever your options are. Click all of your options. You say enjoy the acupuncture. Oh, it's not acupuncture. It is a shot to um, deaden the nerves. So they're not just poking it a little bit. They're poking it all the way to my spine. Not to my spine. To my, uh, is your spine the bones? I guess. Yeah, 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 yeah. Like your nervous cord. What, what's the thing called? What's the cord in your back called? Your spinal cord. Um, so yeah, they're sticking it in there to um, deaden the nerves right around the joints. I don't know what it's called. I'm not a doctor. I don't know. We talked about this yesterday. I don't know what they're doing, but they're doing it. <sighs> Have a good day. Enjoy yourselves. Be nice. And I'll talk to you tomorrow. Assuming I'm not paralyzed. That's a nice thought to end the day.